Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, class. Welcome to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me today. Did you know that the Battle of Monmouth, arguably one of George Washington's greatest moments as a commander, was also an embarrassing chapter of Charles Lee's career, effectively ending his involvement in the war? That the British recognized that the Americans were making a little too much progress with the French and offered terms to end the war in 1778, and also that eventually both the Spanish and Dutch supported the American war effort, making pretty significant impacts. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because today we will learn that and more in episode 66, the Battle of Monmouth and the beginnings of a European war. Hello, everyone. Welcome into episode 66. Today, we are going to transition away from Valley Forge into the campaigning season once again. And we're going to look at how Washington's men fared following their winter of Valley Forge and how things were going in negotiating alliances over in Europe. As we covered in episode 64, the American forces, led by Horatio Gates, were able to defeat and capture John Burgoyne's entire army. Suffering over 1,000 casualties and 6,000 men captured was a huge setback for the British, ruining any real opportunity they had of isolating and taking over the New England region. Coupling that with valiant efforts by Washington and his men at Brandywine and Germantown prior to camping at Valley Forge, and 1778 looked like as good of a time as ever for the French to seriously consider getting involved in this conflict. And that's exactly what they did, totally changing the complexion of the war and forever altering the future of the United States of America. Ever since the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, France and Spain had been licking their wounds, so to speak, building up their armies and navies and patiently awaiting the opportunity to once again open up conflict against the big bad British Empire. When war between Britain and her American colonies formally broke out in 1775, both France and Spain were keeping a close eye on the conflict to see if there would potentially be an opportunity for them to join in on the fun. From the beginning of the conflict, many of the revolutionary Americans recognized that some type of alliance with the French and or the Spanish was a legitimate, viable option. Silas Dean, an American envoy to Paris, was tasked with the responsibilities of beginning a formal relationship between the two powers, this being the American colonies and the French. And his plan was backed by many of the heavy hitters in Congress with Thomas Jefferson being a full-blooded Francophile and men like Benjamin Franklin and John Adams playing critical roles in eventually convincing the French to join the fight. Beginning early in the conflict, France supported the American effort, even if covertly. They sent arms to the colonies in 1776 and 1777 while continuing to engage in diplomatic conversations about potentially creating a formal, official military alliance. George Washington, referencing a shipment of arms to the colonies, wrote in June of 177 that, quote, I was this morning favored with yours containing the pleasing accounts of the late arrivals at Portsmouth and Boston. That of the French ships of war with artillery and other military stores is most valuable. It is my intent to have all the arms that were not immediately wanted by the eastern states to be removed to Springfield, as 
a much safer place than Portsmouth. Recognizing that their odds of success would improve greatly if they were able to negotiate in person, the United States of America, or I should say right now, the American colonies, sent none other than Benjamin Franklin to France to negotiate a treaty with his American colonies. Ben Franklin was officially the first American diplomat and ambassador to the 13 colonies. Arriving late in 1776, he was treated like the celebrity that he was. While Franklin did not speak the native French language, his status as a pop culture icon from America allowed him to blend into upper crust French society living in a suburb of Paris. While living right outside Paris, he often visited with the wealthy French businessmen and politicians who were helping to bankroll the revolutionary efforts of the Americans. And before long, Franklin began to make inroads in his diplomatic efforts. And, I mean, this was not easy. Originally, following the drafting of the Declaration of Independence, the French were pretty excited about the prospect of teaming up with the American colonies. But after the crushing and sort of embarrassing defeats that Washington took at New York— the French had second thoughts. They were stalling a bit, trying to figure out a way to work out a treaty with Spain before committing to the colonies. But once they heard word of Saratoga and rumors that the British were going to offer their own peace terms, which we'll talk about in more detail later in this episode, the French decided to pounce. On December 17, 1777, as Washington and his men were settling into camp at Valley Forge, Benjamin Franklin was completing his most notable achievement, convincing the French to officially recognize the United States as an independent nation. And French officials were given the green light to formally begin to negotiate an alliance with the colonies. After weeks of negotiation, the United States and France entered into this formal military alliance on February 6th. 1778, signing the Treaty of Alliance. This more or less was an insurance policy for France, stating that if Britain were to try to injure France during this conflict with her colonies, they would have the full backing of the United States Army. Brent Franklin was probably thinking, uh, yeah, sure, whatever, of course we'll help. Four days after the French officially notified Britain of the treaty, they declared war on the French. Immediately, now, definitely bringing France into the heart of the conflict. One thing to keep in mind about this treaty is that it was originally signed as an endless treaty. There were no formal end dates. So the United States of America, or I guess at the time the American colonies, and France signed this treaty and there was no end in sight. And this is going to cause a lot of tension in the future because after... The colonies win the Revolutionary War, right, and become the United States of America formally, as recognized by everyone in the world. The Federalist Party, led by none other than Mr. Alexander Hamilton, hated the idea of being tied to France long term and tried to find a way to get us out of it. But that's something that we'll cover in much more detail down the line. In early 1778, under suspicion of profiteering, Silas Dean was removed from his post in Paris, and John Adams was sent to the Atlantic to join Franklin to work to continue to build the relationship with the French and formalize even more support for the war. It became very clear to John that he and Franklin were operating from completely different priorities. Either having learned of the agreement with the French before boarding his ship or shortly after his arrival, Adams was already wondering exactly how useful he would be in the first place. Once he got there, though, this fear became a reality. See, Benjamin Franklin was a rock star. He was charismatic, popular, funny, endearing, and could adapt to the social environment. John Adams was, well, not any of those things. Although he had brought his son, John Quincy Adams, with him, he was there for business and did not understand what the hell Franklin was doing with his time. Being dragged along to different social events began to infuriate Adams, and he did not have much of a grasp for the concept of relationship building and passive negotiation, complaining in his diary that, quote, these incessant dinners and dissipations were not the objects of my mission to France. Adams felt useless disrespected, 
and likely pretty jealous of Franklin and his popularity. Adams returned back to the States only to be sent to France again in 1780. His second trip was even more disastrous, with Adams openly criticizing the French leadership, saying that they were not doing enough to help the American calls in the war. Franklin, infuriated that Adams was undermining his diplomatic efforts, wrote to Congress that Adams, quote, having nothing else wherewith to employ himself, Adams seems to have endeavored to supply what he may suppose my negotiations defective in. Franklin ended up staying as the ambassador to France until 1785, eventually being replaced by Thomas Jefferson and returning to the States to become the president of Pennsylvania. Franklin was an incredible American hero, one we've talked about quite a bit on this podcast, but I think it's important to take the time to recognize him now for his lasting impact on the American war effort. His ability to negotiate an alliance with France and later peace with Britain cannot be understated. Most of the gunpowder used during the war, military support that came in handy later in the war, and a present-day value of about $13 billion in assistance, uh, you could argue that no man outside of George Washington had as big of an impact on the American victory as Benjamin Franklin. But just because Franklin and Adams were putting the full court press on the French to eventually formalize an alliance, didn't mean that the British weren't making their own attempts to secure peace with the colonies. But before we get into the British attempts at peace, let's check back with General Washington and his men at Valley Forge. Because as winter led into spring, Washington's men received news of the alliance with France, and things began to look up. Washington reportedly went around and toasted all of his officers, but that probably isn't totally accurate because if he did, he surely would have fallen off of his horse. Either way, though, there was no denying the enthusiasm that was born from this perspective-altering news. Having survived the very difficult winters, the soldiers were more confident in themselves, both professionally and personally, which was aided by the surging recruitment numbers and fresh, energetic faces arriving to camp. As the American forces began to make preparations for another season, the British were changing things up a bit. In May of 1778, General Howe was removed, likely because of Burgoyne's defeat at Saratoga and Howe's penchant for being too easy on the Americans. Henry Clinton was put in charge of the British forces and will be the new commander-in-chief of the colonies. Clinton was overall respected as a pretty good general, both when it came to strategy and tactics, but some Americans didn't think too much of him. And keep in mind, I mean, General Clinton has a very different war to fight than Howe did, a much more challenging task with the French involved. Because now he has to fight the colonists and the French in the American colonies, while Britain is also trying to defend their land in the Caribbean to keep their sugar production, and hope that France doesn't do anything drastic in Europe that will really handicap him. Because of this, Clinton was told to withdraw from Philadelphia, back to New York, as 5,000 of his men were shipped to the Caribbean and 3,000 sent to Florida. That's 8,000 men being shipped away from him, right? That's, that's a big deal. That was like about, uh, I'm trying to sort of do the math in my head, that was about a third of the overall British forces in the colonies at this time. So in June of 1778, Clinton and his 12,000 men began their 100-mile march to New York, choosing a land route at first to avoid a potential confrontation with the French Navy, and probably really wishing he didn't have to send 8,000 of his men to the south. Damn French. During this march, the British developed a 12-mile baggage train. That is a really long baggage train, and it was moving pretty slowly. This caravan seemed ripe for the picking, and Washington wanted to take advantage of what he deemed to be a vulnerable moment, trying to strike before the British reached New York and settled in. His second-in-command and resident pain in the ass, Charles Lee, told George Washington to wait for a better opportunity and not press his luck. Oh, and in case you didn't remember, Lee is back! He was captured by the British, but later released in a prisoner exchange, meeting back up with Washington and his men at Valley Forge. And by all accounts, everyone was pretty excited because while Lee is a total pain, he was a really good general. 
and very respected by many men. But like Washington had a tendency to do from time to time, he thanked Lee for his advice, took it very seriously, and then respectfully chose to ignore it. So Washington called a war council on June 24th to talk through his plan to move forward to attack the baggage train with his men. He found out that there were quite a few that agreed with him and quite a few that didn't, but once again, this was something that he really wanted to do. He decided he was going to send about 4,000 men as an advanced force to strike at the British at Monmouth Courthouse, hopefully delaying them until he could enter into battle with his entire force. So the idea would be he would send about 4,000 men forward, fight the British, hold them up, while he brought the artillery and the rest of his major force to the battlefield. Like I said, while not everyone agreed with Washington, men like Nathaniel Greene and Lafayette energetically supported his plan, and of course Alexander Hamilton, because Hamilton pretty much always supported everything Washington did. And so did Lafayette, for that matter. Lafayette wrote that, quote, It would be disgraceful for the chiefs and humiliating for the troops to allow the enemy to traverse the jerseys tranquilly. Washington initially gave the advance force to Charles Lee, but Lee, not believing this was going to be effective, which he had made quite public, turned it down. While many other officers were drinking the Kool-Aid after their winter at Valley Forge and excited about the Army's newfound confidence, uh, Lee wasn't really one of them. When Washington decided to increase the advanced attack to 5,000 men and planned on offering it to Lafayette, Lee and his ego had a change of heart. He surely wasn't going to allow some French officer who barely old enough to shave to take his potential glory. He asked for the command, and while it seemed strange that someone so opposed to the idea would want to command the advancing guard, Washington didn't think much of it, and he and Lafayette went along with it. On a side note, though, and something that's actually really interesting, looking back on this moment, one can't help to wonder what was going through Charles Lee's mind. See, Lee had actually written a pretty damning document while in captivity in 1777, titled, Mr. Lee's Plan, March 29, 1777. This was a plan for how the British, that right, the British, could pull off a victory over the Americans. It was found 80 years later in General Howe's personal correspondences. Not knowing what Lee's motivations may or may not have been, Washington moved forward with allowing Charles Lee to command the advance guard. On June 28th, Lee set out to attack the British rear guard, led by Cornwallis. But because of poor preparation and communication, and potentially the disingenuous motivations of Lee, the American effort began to immediately fall apart, and Lee soon ordered a withdrawal. At this news, Cornwallis decided to press his advantage and was setting himself up to throw the knockout punch. As this was happening, Washington was on his way to the front lines and flummoxed by rumors that Lee and his men were retreating. Because, see, like I mentioned, the entire point of an advanced force is to attack and maintain pressure on the enemy until the main forces arrive. I mean, you're supposed to stay in the field and do literally whatever you can. You cannot retreat. Your job is to stay there until the main force arrives. As Washington neared the front lines, he kept running into fleeing soldiers, incredulously asking them what they were doing. When they informed him, they, were, they weren't abandoning. They weren't running away. They were just following their general's orders. Washington was agog. He refused to believe that Lee had actually ordered a retreat until, that is, he ran into General Lee. By all accounts, George Washington, a man who was admired for almost always being able to control his temper, totally flipped out on Lee, delivering an emasculating, profanity-laced verbal lashing at his second-in-command. General Charles Scott, a witness to the event, said that, quote, Leaves shook on the tree as Washington screamed at Lee. When I think about this moment, I can't help but think that some of Washington's rage may have stemmed from his feelings of regret for putting Lee in charge of these troops. Because remember, he had originally planned on giving them to Lafayette when Lee first hesitated. 
Washington had only known what Lee had written while he was captured by the British. Whew. Wow. Relieving him of command, Washington took over the forces and rushed to the front lines, commanding the men to, quote, Stand fast, my boys, and receive your enemy. The southern troops are advancing to support you. While employing rear guard action, Washington rallied his main forces, now totaling about 13,000 men, to stand their ground against the pursuing British advance. Having handed Lee's men over, at least part of them, to Lafayette, Washington uh, and his remaining officers, Sterling, Wayne, and Green, all began to furiously prepare their men for the British onslaught. Sterling, commanding the left flank, was attacked first but able to repulse the British after about an hour of fire. Cornwallis then reformed and personally led men against the other flank, the American right, under Nathaniel Green. That also failed. As Cornwallis was doing that, the British also pushed up the middle, engaging with Wayne's troops. This was a somewhat ineffective advance, too. Beaten back three times, the British were finally able to force Wayne and his men to fall back to the main lines, but that was about it. Darkness was approaching, and they decided to withdraw. Three attacks, 0 for 3. Washington was pumped. He wanted to counterattack, but with light running low, he decided to wait until the morning. He wasn't really sure what this felt like. He had, he had never been on this side of it when the sun was going down and it was actually messing him up as opposed to saving his army. Then Clinton took a page right out of Washington's playbook and kept the fires going and retreated during the night, continuing his march to New York. Total casualties were a few hundred for each side, and the battle ended in a draw with the Americans keeping the field but the British being able to beat off their initial attacks and continue their march unmolested. But although all, on paper it seemed like a draw, Washington and his men did not see it that way. They thought that this was an undeniable victory for the American forces, with GW as their determined, fearless leader. Lafayette remarked after seeing Washington's actions at Monmouth that, quote, I thought then as now I had never beheld so superb a man. And here, we are beginning to find out on this podcast that no one held a man crush on Washington, like the Marquis de Lafayette. The British then hopped on boats, and the Royal Navy took them to New York to set up their defenses and prepare for, really, the next phase of the war. But Washington decided not to attack New York, and the Battle of Monmouth was the last major battle of the Northern Theater for the rest of the war. Charles Lee was court-martialed for his cowardice and incompetence and had his command stripped from him, and this was approved by a close vote in Congress. He was suspended for one year. Lee threw a fit about it, and Congress basically informed him that, okay, well now your removal is permanent if you're going to act like that. Lee trashed Washington publicly, and it got so bad that one of Washington's aide-de-camp, John Lorenz, and his right-hand man, Alexander Hamilton, challenged Lee to a duel. Lawrence and Lee had at it, and Charles is shot in the side. Not a war mortal wound, but Lawrence now did his job and defended Washington's honor. Lee actually wanted to go again. He wanted round two. He called for a pulse, said, hold on a second, I'm shot in the side, looked at it, said, hmm, not that bad. Let's do it again. And Hamilton and um, Lee's uh, right-hand man, his second-in-command, were the ones that convinced them, no, guys, it, it's done. Um, Lawrence wanted to uh, have a duel because you insulted Washington. Lee, you wanted to have a duel because you had to defend your honor. You've now been able to accomplish both of those things. We're done. And eventually, cooler heads prevailed, and they finished up after one round. Lee retired against his will and died from yellow fever in 1782 one year after the decisive Battle of Yorktown. One last note on the Battle of Monmouth. This is the battle that created the legend of Molly Pitcher. Her name was Mary Ludwig Hayes, and she was the wife of an American artilleryman. She lived near the battlefield and reportedly kept traveling back and forth with pitchers of water for the men and even stood in for her husband when he fell and then helped him care for his wounds. With the French joining in on the fighting and Washington's new and improved forces, the 
British recognized that this might be their last chance to try to negotiate some type of peace before things got out of hand. I mean, this war was starting to get to that point, and the British did not know if they had the men or the money to not just subdue the colonial threat, but now defend all of their other land from the French and maybe other European powers who would choose to join the fighting. The first attempt at peace between the British and the colonies was all the way back in September 1776, when the Second Continental Congress agreed to meet with Admiral Howe just prior to the fighting in New York, something that we mentioned quite briefly when we were covering that. But there's a clear disconnect between the parties, since the Congress had just recently declared independence, and Howe wasn't allowed to acknowledge that, so it was sort of a non-starter. But after the victory at Saratoga, Rumors of French involvement and an American army that was improving by the month uh, changed things drastically on the other side of the pond. Prime Minister Lord North immediately had Parliament repeal the Tea Act and the Massachusetts Government Act, while also reaching out to the Second Continental Congress to try to find some type of negotiated settlement with the colonies. This was a drastic change to how the Parliament was treating the colonies. Prior to this, they viewed and communicated with the colonies as individual states, not even a collective unit. Now, this offer was far more appealing than the one Britain offered in 1776, and who knows what would have happened if they presented this to the colonies earlier. Maybe the entire conflict could have potentially been avoided. But they didn't, so we'll never know. This commission, headed by the Earl of Carlisle, which is where it derived its name, decided to head out to the colonies in the spring, even though it recently had been reported that the American colonies in France had entered into a treaty of alliance. But according to Horace Walpole, a former notable member of Parliament, the commission wasn't much of a genuine attempt at peace to begin with. Walpole observed that Carlisle was, quote, very fit to make a treaty that will not be made, and that he was, quote, totally unacquainted with business, and though not void of ambition, have but moderate parts and less application. As they left for the colonies, members of the commission were notified that General Clinton had been asked to withdraw from Philly, which was <laughs> enraging news, to say the least, because these diplomats knew that if the British withdrew from Philadelphia, coupling that with the diplomatic progress the colonies were making in France— there was a good chance the colonial resolve would grow significantly, and this entire thing was all for naught. Carlyle wrote that, quote, We all look grave, and perhaps we think we look wise. I fear nobody will think so when we return. I don't see what we have to do upon here. Even in the face of these odds, the commission decided to move forward with their attempts at diplomacy. In June, just prior to Monmouth, they offered terms with the Americans, but the Congress wasn't budging. They were okay with the idea of peace, as long as the British recognized their independence and withdrew from the colonies. Unsurprisingly, while the Commission was offering things like political representation in Parliament and less taxes and more freedom, they weren't going to do those two things. The Commission continued to try to negotiate, appealing to public opinion, warning the Americans that the looming destruction is going to come if this war is to continue, but all of this was to no avail. The commission returned to Britain in the fall with no progress to show for their efforts. The British tried their hand at peace one more time in 1780, offering like literally everything except full-blown independence. And again, get nowhere. It's believed that this failure was one of the reasons why Benedict Arnold eventually decided to turn traitor against the American forces, something we will cover in a lot more detail soon. Following the diplomatic efforts, the British were met with even more bad news as the war continued to progress. It was difficult enough fighting against the colonies and the French, but also defending themselves against the Spanish and the Dutch? Ugh, talk about creating a mountain out of a molehill. Having been covertly supplying the American forces with arms through their port in New Orleans, the Spanish then granted favored nation status to the Americans in March of 1777, allowing them access to the port of Havana. Being in the middle of a war with Portugal, believing the French were still a ways away from being fully prepared to enter the war, and still bitter over their quick decision to prematurely enter the French and Indian War, Spain decided that they would continue to supply the Americans, but not formally get involved. 
yet. But by June of 1779, the Spanish were ready to go and formally joined the war with France. The Spanish immediately set their sights on Gibraltar and Menorca. Though a valiant defense, the British were able to, somewhat shockingly, hang on to Gibraltar throughout the war, but did see Menorca back to the Spanish. The Spanish then turned their attention to Cuba, West Florida, the Mississippi Valley, and other areas in the West, straining the British resolve throughout much of the southeastern part of the continent. In the end, the Spanish efforts in the war were incredibly valuable to the Americans and the Spanish. Spanish won back all of Florida, Menorca, and lessened the British threat in the Caribbean. They bolstered their perception as a world power, and because of some of the fortunate silver mines that they found in Bolivia and Mexico, they were able to fairly easily pay off their debt. It was a gamble, but it was a good one. Holland, like the Spanish, also involved themselves in this war supporting the American colonies. From early in the revolutionary movement, the American colonists had sympathetic ears in Holland, with many Dutch merchants emphasizing with their complaints and trading openly with the Americans even after the war began. American officer John Paul Jones wrote in 1779 that, quote, the Dutch people are for us and for the war. Having been allies of Britain for over 100 years, it took a while for the French to formally enter the war in support of the American colonies. The city of Amsterdam, anticipating such an alliance, entered into a secret treaty to begin open trading with the colonies once their independence was recognized by Holland. When the English got a hold of this secret treaty, they were furious, and they declared war on Holland. I mean, Britain was just declaring war on everybody. By 1782, Holland became the second country in the world to formally recognize the United States as an independent nation. John Adams, the American envoy to Holland, so he, because he went from France, he went back to France, and then uh, he ended up being the American envoy to Holland, he was incredibly proud of this development writing that he was able to, quote, tear Holland from England's bosom, a faithful ally, by availing himself of the still small voice of reason, without money and without intrigue. The involvement of the Dutch was very beneficial for the American colonies, with Holland lending a total of $12 million to their cause, creating pretty much all of the foreign debt that the United States had to deal with when they emerged victorious in the war. Unfortunately, the alliance with the colonies was not as beneficial for the Dutch as it was for the Spanish. They suffered a defeat at the hands of the British in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War and lost all of their Indian possessions. The involvement in the war also destabilized their politics, putting them on the brink of civil war. As you pack up your things, I'd like you to put into context the state of the Revolutionary War at this time. Washington, at Monmouth, one could argue, rebounded. His army has momentum and confidence. France is involved. Britain recognizes that this is a big deal, and they decide to change strategy. And it seems to be, like many things, for George Washington and this American army two steps forward, one step back. Because as we'll cover next episode, the British find early success in the South and once again begin to change the complexion of this conflict. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.